Uh, on behalf of the APS Fund for Teaching and the Public Understanding of Psychological Science, I have the great pleasure of introducing this year's distinguished APS David Myers Lecturer on Teaching, Daniel Willingham. Daniel Willingham received his PhD from Harvard University. He now teaches at the University of Virginia, where he has been the recipient of numerous teaching awards. His prolific scholarship has addressed memory and learning using multidisciplinary methods, and he has excelled at giving psychological science away to the great benefit of primary, secondary, and higher education. If, as he has written, quote, thinking is the hardest work there is, unquote, there are few in our field who have worked harder than Daniel Willingham to contribute thoughtfully to the social good. Please join me in welcoming Daniel Willingham. Thanks very much for that kind introduction, Neil. And thank you all very much for uh, spending a little bit of time with me this afternoon. Um, as you can see, my topic is about using psychological science in K-12 education. Uh, and, and also, as you can see, it's about improving the use of psychological science in K-12 education, because certainly attempts are being made to use it. Uh, but I'm going to suggest we're not doing as good a job as we can. So here's the basic outline of the talk, four main points uh, that I want to hit. Uh, as you can see, I pose the question, how can K-12 educators use psychological science? And there's the answer for you. There's the spoiler. It's, uh, I'm going to talk specifically about developing in teachers a useful mental model of the learner, uh, understanding how kids think. Uh, but I'll go on to suggest that, first of all, we're, we're already trying to do that, but we have a problem in doing it. We're not as successful as we ought to be. Uh, and then I will propose a solution, more careful attention as to what ought to go into the model. Uh, and then finally, this is sort of the, the bumper sticker version of uh, my assessment of what the, what the issue is, why we're less successful than we ought to be. What we're doing is we're training future practitioners as though they are future researchers. So I will elaborate on that as we go. Uh, but let's start here. Uh, with the, uh, thinking through how uh, K-12 educators can use psychological science. So here's basic science. Here's the stuff that most of us at this conference are doing, trying to understand how people think. There are two main methods by which we can use information from the basic sciences to inform education. One is things that we learn about how children think can be used to inspire new materials and practices. So a classic example of this would be Skinnerian behaviorism, which has influenced classrooms and continues to influence classrooms in its conception of the role of rewards and occasionally punishments in classrooms. So many teachers think about behaviorist principles as they think about, especially in early elementary, as they're thinking about how to get kids to uh, conform to the rules of the classroom. So we can get inspiration for new practices in teaching. The second method is where we use methods from basic science to evaluate classroom practices. So for example, if you're not familiar with it, Accelerated Reader is a program that's usually used school-wide that's meant to uh, improve motivation for reading, increase children's motivation to read. Uh, more of you might be familiar with Pizza Hut's Book It program if you're of a certain age and, and are an American kid that was deeply embedded in many, many schools. That was a program by which if you uh, read a certain number of books, you got a free personal pan pizza. Now, neither of these were inspired by basic science. They were inspired by, well, it's pretty obvious what they were inspired by, but you could evaluate the extent to which they work. So we've got methods in science that are better than casual observation to evaluate whether accelerated reader improves motivation as it claims compared to uh, business as usual in classrooms, and then we can compare it to Pizza Hut, Book It, and so forth. Okay, so those are the two main methods. We can think about new practices, or we can take practices that were inspired in some way other than basic science, and we can use methods of science to evaluate their effectiveness. What I'm really concerned about is a third method, a uh, third way that basic science can uh, help with education, uh, and it's... Uh, uh, illustrated here. So this was a, a conversation I had with a teacher 
a couple years ago now, it was October, she was a brand new teacher. I said, how's it going? You know, you had a month in the classroom. And she said, well, no one told me in any of my education classes how to deal with a spinner. In fact, they didn't tell me what, you know, that I, was, I should anticipate having a spinner. And whenever I give this talk with teachers, everyone's like, oh, a spinner. If you're not familiar with what a spinner is, a spinner is, in this case, it was a, a, a young girl in second grade who at unpredictable times gets up out of her seat and goes in a corner and starts spinning. Right? This is an illustration of a very general problem that teachers have, which is we try and uh, give them uh, training and experiences that will prepare them for classrooms, but classrooms are unpredictable. They are going to encounter problems that, they, that no one told them they were going to encounter. So what do they do at those moments that they, uh, they, they have this novel problem? Well, this is where basic science can actually help. Uh, because what they're going to do at that moment is going to be at least partially informed by what I'm going to call a mental model of a learner. So these are beliefs about cognition and emotion and motivation in children. It's basically what they, what they think kids are like. They're going to uh, rely on that at least in part. Um, they, we, we do have some empirical evidence about uh, what sort of mental models uh, teachers do have. It won't surprise you to learn that we know that teachers, before they begin their training uh, for, for classrooms, they already come into their training with beliefs about what kids are like. Um, and that those beliefs are affected by the training that they experience. And they're also affected by classroom experiences. So our goal here is really that educators will have a more informed mental model of how children learn. This is we think that we as basic scientists have something to offer here. OK, so that's the, uh, the, the main setup, the, the main problem that I'm interested in. And now let me tell you why I think we might have a problem. So what I'm suggesting is the mental model of the learner that most teachers have could be better. Or it could be better informed by science. How do we know that? Well, the truth is we don't know, we know less about this than you would think we do. One thing we'd like to know is what are teachers, future teachers, taught about how children learn? What are they taught about kids' emotion and, and motivation lives? Well, the answer is it's very, very hard to generalize. There are thousands of programs that train future teachers, and they vary a great deal. Right. As, as you would expect, if you're training to be a high school social studies teacher, you're going to undergo a different program of training than if you aim to be an early elementary reading uh, specialist, for example. Um, and also, there are different state requirements. That said, there is some consistency. And one of the consistency that people have pointed out is almost all of the programs do require some exposure to this content. It's either in an educational psychology class or a foundations of education course. So even though we don't have great data on this, most people think most teachers probably are exposed to this content. More persuasive, I think, is looking at licensing exams. So thinking about exams that teachers have to pass in order to be licensed as a public school teacher in various states. Each state has uh, different licensing requirements. Uh, but many of them use a test called the Praxis II, which is written by Educational Testing Service. It's used by about 35 states. Um, and if you look at the, the uh, guidelines that are published by Educational Testing Service for how to study for the Praxis, it includes information that we might expect. Uh, it's include regarding what people are supposed to know about educational psychology. Okay, so this is a pretty good reason to think that teachers are probably exposed to this, and at some point, uh, they, they actually need to learn it. Now, that doesn't mean that practicing teachers actually remember it. And again, our data here are not as robust as we would like them to be. But when we have studies of what teachers know about how kids learn, the results are often disappointing. So this is a recent study from 2017. This was a large survey that had uh, respondents evaluate lots of different statements. What you're seeing here is a small subset of statements. These were plucked out in particular because they are commonly referred to as neuromyths. They are uh, common beliefs that the public holds about how people learn that are false. Right? And so what you're seeing, so things like that, uh, uh, 
people, different people learn according to uh, different learning styles, that dyslexia, um, the problem there is that children are seeing letters backwards, the Mozart effect, and so forth. And you can see the columns. I'm sure you've already been looking at it. These are percentage of people endorsing these statements as true. And you can see educators are generally doing better than the public, but we were, they're not really where we would like them to be, right? They, they, these, all these figures should be very close to zero. So that's, that's a little bit disheartening. Another really informative source of data on teacher training comes from the American Federation Teacher, uh, excuse me, American Federation of Teachers survey from 2012. So the AFT is one of the two big teachers unions. They represent about a million teachers nationwide. Um, and so they did a very high quality uh, nationally representative survey of their membership. And they asked them about their opinion of their education. And in general, they were pretty lukewarm. They said it was not very influential to my practice. The number one influence on their practice, according to this survey, is their own experience. Second most important um, influence on their practice is the experience of other teachers that they know and respect. And then quite low down on the list is their training. Their big complaints, in addition to it sort of not being very useful, which is certain, certainly in accordance with, it, with what they're saying that, no, that I, don't, I don't use it very often, too theoretical. They say it's interesting. So to the extent they like it, they're like, it's sort of an intellectual exercise. Uh, and it's kind of fun and interesting to hear about, but it's not really of, of very high utility. So putting all that together, what it sounds like is there's an expectation that future teachers are going to learn this content. It's in licensing exams. They must learn it to some extent in order to pass the licensing exam. But then if you look at practicing the teachers, they're not pointing to that as anything there they find very useful in their practice. And indeed, it seems like based on the data we have, they've forgotten a lot of it. And of